Welcome to 157 of the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I'm someone who doesn't drink alcohol. I spend every waking moment helping other people doing the same, including recording this podcast called The Wall. I don't know about you. Every time someone mentions a wall, and it's been mentioned quite a lot in this house this week, because Liza is, uh, as you know, she's American. She's from Los Angeles, and she is sitting her life in the UK test this week. Yes, if you want to be a British citizen or you want to live here uh, or reside here permanently as a wife of a a British citizen, then you have to take a test. Yeah. And you basically have to pay £50 every time you take this test and you get asked 24 questions. And I think you need to get like a 75% success rate. If you fail, you have to then reapply again and pay another 50 quid. And there is a quite... I think it's like a seven day waiting uh, period between each test and you can't apply for the test uh, 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 with it. You have to apply for the test within like, I don't know, a three to four week window of your actual uh, visa expiring, which means uh, we booked our flights to go to Los Angeles at the end of the month. And uh, if Liza doesn't pass her test or we don't go broke by the time she's passed her test, uh, then I'm going to end up flying to Los Angeles with Zia and Liza's going to be stuck here. Um, it is an absolute joke. I've got to say, I know this is the alcohol addiction podcast, but let's just turn it to politics for a little bit. Um, this isn't about immigration. This is just an absolute cash grab. Everything to do with the visa process is a cash grab. It's just a way of getting more and more money into the, the coffers of the government because it's a joke. Um, I live in, in the UK and I've lived here all my life and I regularly fail that test that she's doing. Um, I mean, I, I said, didn't I, at the beginning that, you know, the wall has come up a lot this week. You know, Liza has been talking about Hadrian's Wall, for example. I didn't know Hadrian's Wall was a wall erected by the Romans to keep the barbarians of the north out of the south. I mean, I didn't know that. I mean, I know in the back of my mind that Hadrian's Wall was a wall that was built between Scotland and, uh, and England probably learnt it somewhere back and beyond in geography. But what the hell does that have to do with uh, living in the UK? Why do you have to know that? Okay, here's some other beauties. Um, How many ski centres are there in Scotland? (laughs) She's moving to Cardiff. Like, why does she care how many ski centres there are in Scotland? Um, And then there's some absolute beauties in there, like... um, what do we give each other on Valentine's Day? What do we eat on Christmas Day? Turkey, beef, salmon, or or, or pheasant? Um, and then the, the actual crackers that are really kind of worrying and complicated is, you know, it's like the monarchy. It's like, um, who was the queen before Elizabeth minus the 31st or whatever? Or who reigned in the UK from 1832 to 1840? I mean... Oh, man. Oh, it's an absolute balls ache. By the time this finishes, it would have cost us in excess of £10,000 sterling, 10,000 sterling for Liza to eventually be a British citizen. Okay, it's not even a British citizen for indefinite leave to remain here. All right. That is absurd because I'm from the UK and my daughter was born in the UK and yet her mum and my wife has to pay over £10,000, and you wouldn't believe the paperwork, folks. God knows what it's going to be like when I try to uh, do the same thing in America. Um, but yeah, walls. Whatever I think about walls, <laughs> um, just uh, and as an aside, I always think of Game of Thrones. When's Game of Thrones coming back on? I love Game of Thrones. And, you know, I'll put it out there. If you are really struggling um, to find something to do to get your mind off alcohol, and you've never seen Game of Thrones before... And it's coming the witching hour on Friday night. Go back to season one and watch Game of Thrones instead. Yeah, you'll develop a nasty addiction to Netflix, but we can deal with that after you've cured your problem with alcohol, right? Um, Now, on November 1st, which is, let's have a look, it's Tuesday the 30th of October today. So uh, November 1st is in two days. We will be starting uh, the uh, November taster. £49, 27 daily videos to help you become alcohol-free for November. Can you go alcohol-free for November? Let's do it, okay? Peer group learning. So you're going to be in a group of other people trying the same thing. And um, I will be there helping you with your assignments 
and giving you a glimpse into the truth about alcohol, raising awareness of that truth, and um, helping you to understand how you will fit yourself back into society um, as someone who doesn't drink alcohol, surrounded by people who do. So if you want to take the taster, then head to www.thetruthaboutalcohol.co.uk and you'll find out how to do that there or just email me directly at thetruthaboutalcohol at gmod.com and I'll send you the link. Looking forward to working with you if you get on board with that. And please do. It'll be a, a, a great thing for you. So a short and sweet um, podcast today. Uh, this week is going to be um, William Porter week, actually. If you've um, never heard of William Porter, William Porter is the author of the quite amazing book, Alcohol Explained. And I love this book. I'm not going to go on about it too much today because we're going to go in depth on it, on it tomorrow. Um, but I'm going to talk about the wall, something that um, William Porter talks about in his book. We're going to talk about that concept today. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to spend an hour, maybe a little bit longer, uh, going through William's book, uh, Alcohol Explained. I'm going to do a little bit of review on that, pull out some quotes and just talk about um, why his book is brilliant and why you should buy it and um, why there's nothing else out there like that that I've read at the moment anyway. Uh, so we're going to do that. And then on, so that will be Wednesday, you'll get that. And then on Thursday, um, you'll hear from the man himself because I'm interviewing him tomorrow. So I'm going to interview him tomorrow and I will get that podcast episode out on Thursday. So if you've got a question for William Porter, you've got 24 hours to get that to me at thetruthbutalcohol at gmail.com and I'll ask him for you, okay? And I uh, think that's Thursday. On Friday, there's an episode coming out called Drugs, which again is... Uh, from something that William said. Everything I do this week, you can have a podcast every day, and it's going to be from William Porter. So it's William Porter week at the Tomb of Our Algar, okay? So I'm going to do a quote out of uh, William Porter's book, On the Wall, and he says, often, when we try to stop drinking, the wall, okay, simply isn't strong enough to resist temptation. And what he means by the wall is he's saying that we create in our minds a psychological wall, um, when we decide that we're going to stop drinking alcohol, to keep out all, all the thoughts that we have, like kind of racing around our, our brain, trying to get us or convince us to drink alcohol. And you hear me talk a lot in The Truth About Alcohol about resistance. That is that voice. And I guess the wall, as I take it when I listen to William Porter, is the, is the psychological wall that we're building up that keeps the resistance out. Okay, the resistance out because it's the resistance telling us repeatedly drink alcohol, don't listen to William Porter, his books a load of rubbish, don't listen to Lee's podcast, he doesn't know what he's on about. Drink alcohol, you'll be miserable without it. That is the type of thing um, that we have to deal with, and we have to deal with this um, constant noise. Uh, the other thing we need to keep out are the desires, the cravings, the thoughts, and beliefs that alcohol provides us with value. Um, all that stuff we need to keep away from us, and, and William refers to the wall, okay? If you've ever done the Truth About Alcohol Intensive or Taster, you know that we talk about our artillery. So we say to ourselves, what artillery are we going to need? If we're going to go to war with alcohol, what artillery do we need to take on this beast, okay? Um, um, many of the things that we're talking about is actually around defense, how are we going to defend ourselves about uh, from alcohol as a way in and not necessarily how we're going to attack alcohol. And I think one of the things that we could incorporate in the Taste and Intensive after reading Porter's book is this wall. How how can we build this wall? Um, how, how does that work? How do we do it brick by brick? And, and who do we need to help us do that? So I'll just repeat again. Um, William Porter says, often when we try to stop drinking, the wall that we're building, the psychological wall, simply isn't strong enough to resist the temptation. This is where we give in to the craving. And this is why... Uh, at the truth about alcohol, our philosophy is to become someone who doesn't drink alcohol without craving. Because it's there is a lot of people who do successfully white knuckle it for the rest of their life. All kind of drug addiction. Uh, I particularly can think of my um, ex father in law who gave up smoking, uh, and he did it. He just white knuckled it, and he, he occasionally will say he, when he'll smell someone smoking that he feels like having a cigarette. Like all that many years later, um, I'm not a fan of that. Like I, I don't want to be craving anything. Because if I'm craving it, then I'm, I'm and, I, and I don't want to take it because it's a drug, be that sugar, alcohol, nicotine, drugs, whatever, then um, I'm going to be 
feeling miserable because I want that thing that I can't have. So um, what we work out, the truth about alcohol, is actually removing that desire, removing that craving, so you don't want to drink alcohol in the first place. And you're all right then, you're not feeling miserable about it, okay? So here he is, he's talking about, um, it's really important that we build this psychological wall up so we don't have to give in to the craving. Then he says, though, however, even if the wall is strong enough to begin with, so even if we have built up this real powerful defense against temptation, the effects is dealt with in the chapter on FAB, which is uh, an acronym for fading effect bias, mean that the wall will weaken over time as our memory of the bad parts of life when we are drinking fade. Okay, let me say that again. However, even if the wall is strong enough to begin with, the effects as dealt with in the chapter on FAB, fade and effect bias, means that the wall will weaken over time as our memory of the bad parts of life when we were drinking start to fade. Now, what is fade and effect bias? Well, um, we'll touch on it a little bit here. Um, William doesn't go into great detail on it, but he just talks about it briefly. He says, the fade and effect bias essentially describes a process whereby good memories persist longer than bad ones, all right? Or more accurately, where we tend to view events in the past as a more positive light as time passes on. Um, what FAB actually means is not that we totally forget anything bad that has happened to us and remember only the good things. What FAB refers to is a process by which over time our memory of any situation becomes slightly warped, uh, specifically as the memory of the good parts remain and the and memory of the bad parts fade. So let me give you a, an example uh, of that. Uh, my first ever uh, marriage. So whenever I think of... Um, Again, if you work on the taster and you work on the intensive, you'll know that we talk a lot about non-declarative memories and the importance of them in the process of alcoholism. And non-declarative memories are these um, these powerful memories that are lodged in our subconscious and play out like a, a movie script each time and every time uh, we need to, our body needs to do something that our mind can't be bothered dealing with, like driving a car, uh, remembering your your PIN number on the ATM machine. You know, your brain might not remember it. Your brain doesn't have to think about how to drive. Your body already knows how to do it, and that's because of the non-declarative memories. But there's also something called declarative memories. And declarative memories, if you think about it, like I'm 43, so I've had, what, a gazillion memories in 43 years, but I don't remember them all, do I? Sometimes something will occasionally trigger a memory, but in general, my, the way my brain works is it has to have a hierarchy of memories that are really important to me and those that aren't because it can't fit them all in my brain, okay? So what it does is is declarative memories that are absolutely soaked with emotion are the ones that it will remember the most. So if I, if, if I was to say to you, close your eyes right now and straight away instantly think of the happiest time of your life, what would it be? Now, when I think of that, one of the first memories that comes to my mind is being a 21-year-old getting married, okay? And, and why is that? Well, I think about marrying my childhood sweetheart. I think about getting all dressed up. I think about uh, the stag weekends that we had and the camaraderie that I had with my mates. I think about the nervous tension I had as I was waiting to go into the church all the people of the of the valley who knew us who weren't invited to the wedding were all outside to cheer and throw confetti and stuff. Uh, my friends were all in. Everybody I loved was in in that room at that day, either the church or at the ceremony afterwards. I remember the songs that we danced to. I, I remember the jokes and, and the comedy and all that. And, and because of that, um, I had all the right... Uh, chemicals, right? So I had the dopamine, I had the serotonin, the GABA, everything that I needed to have a good time, it was there. So I think about that, okay? Now I think where fade and effect bias comes in here is, is that all that happened, right? Well, no, it isn't. Because actually, I can't remember great parts of the evening because I got too drunk, all right? I do, however, remember going back to the hotel afterwards where we're, you know, wanting to consummate my marriage, feeling really, really horny. And all of a sudden, my ex-wife says, well, hang on a minute, you're going to have to put my stocking up. Like, one of her stockings had, like, come undone. And I'm like, you know, forget your stocking. I can't, I couldn't do it because I was too drunk. You know, and I'm horny, I want a bit, and I'm just like, no, forget the stocking. And it turned into a big row. And when I say big row, I mean so someone had left us a bottle of champagne and a couple of flutes. 
and a load of strawberries. And she was throwing those flutes of champagne at me and strawberries. There was glass everywhere. Uh, the, the guy who looked after the place came uh, to, to tell us to calm down and we, we fired a few fucks into him. Um, and we just had a massive fight on our wedding night, okay? When a bed woke up the next morning, we'd learned that Princess Diana died. We were fucking hungover. Her wedding dress was just caked and covered in red wine. We were a fucking mess, right? Really, really badly hungover, right? Now, I don't remember those kind of things as much as I should do because of the fading effect bias. My brain wants to remember that that moment was an excellent, wonderful moment. It doesn't want to remember the, the bad parts about it. And this is really important when you think about it because it was the alcohol that injected and ruined the experience. But because of fading effect bias, okay, and because of our cognitive dissonance and our... Uh, good work we've done over many, many years to dispel the cognitive dissonance so we don't focus on the bad parts of alcohol, we only focus on the good parts. We trained our subconscious to just focus on the really good parts of our terrifying ordeal. This is why when I got stabbed when I was 18 and I had 25 stitches and nearly died, I actually remember getting stabbed and having 25 stitches and nearly dying as a positive, funny, happy moment. How bizarre is that? Because I told that story to people and they laughed and joked about it. I turned it into a joke. That is the power of the cognitive dissonance. That is the power of the fading effect bias. And what William is saying is over time, we we build this wall up um, and this part of this wall, this brick by brick wall could be all the negative associations we have with alcohol, okay? But, and, and that then, so instead of thinking about my wedding as being a fantastic time, I can think of it that alcohol fucked it up. Instead of thinking of getting stabbed as being a wonderful thing, I can think of it, wow, I nearly lost my life because of alcohol, etc., 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 and build up this wall of this negative association with alcohol and alcoholism, okay, which is in effect what we're doing at The Truth About Alcohol with our philosophy, and this is how we develop this, um, this, this understanding, this awareness, alcohol has no value and therefore we have no craving, is we're building up these walls. But William is saying just be careful because over time, um, those walls or, or, or the strength of that wall will... will decrease because of the fading effect bias he's actually saying some people even tear it down themselves so they even tear this wall down themselves in a mistaken belief that it served its purpose okay and that having had the power to stop drinking now they now have the power to control it so what he's saying is we do a real good job we build up the wall with all these negative associations with alcohol we really protect ourselves we're on the guard so we don't have any temptation or cravings no desire and then at some point we say to ourselves you know what i don't need this anymore i'm feeling fucking great i'm feeling a million dollars i could just i i know um, I'm totally different now. My philosophy is different around alcohol. I think about it completely different. So I don't need to stop drinking. I know I can control it. And then they start drinking again. And, it's, and, and, and look, you either can resist the first drink or you can't. And once you drink that first drink, you're fucked. It's going to take you, I don't know, a couple of weeks, maybe a month. You're going to be right back where you were before you reached out and said, I need help. All right? Always happens. Okay? So I think that's really important. Um to just talk about that and to understand that, that yes, we need to build a wall, okay? Really super important. But there are times when the fading effect bias and our cognitive dissonance, okay? And and the way that our declarative and non-declarative memories work is it can fool us into actually dismantling our own wall to pretend we don't need it, okay? That is resistance, folks. That is your resistance. When, you are, when you're saying to yourself, I don't want to drink alcohol anymore. I don't think I need... I, sorry. When you're saying, I think I can moderate. I think I don't need this wall anymore. I don't need this artillery. I don't need these weapons. I don't need anything to defend against alcohol. I, I've got it sussed. I could just take it on in a fist fight. That's resistance. It's leading you down a guard. It's re- leading you into an ambush. It knows that you can't. You cannot defeat alcohol. And that is why it does it. Okay. Um... I thought that was um, a super important uh, piece of work that William talks about in there. Uh, fading effect bias is really important. Uh, building up these walls, uh, super important. But most importantly, if you are going to build a wall in your garden right now, okay, what are you going to do? Like, Are you going to do it alone? You could do it alone. But how much quicker and how much more effective would that wall be if you asked a couple of your mates to help you with it? All right. You get it done quicker, more effective, even out the load. You can get more time on your hands to do other things. 
It's the same thing with these psychological walls you're building in your mind, okay? You're drinking alone, you're building those walls alone, all right? You're trying to stop drinking alone. Don't do that. You don't have to do that because at Strive Movement, we're here to help you build that wall. People who understand you, who see you, who hear you, who've been where you are, okay? They know the right bricks. They know the right formation. They know the right form of cement. They can help you build these walls. So join Strive Movement today. It's five pounds a month, okay? It's five pounds a month for a reason because I only want really serious people who are interested in the truth about alcohol philosophy and becoming a part of our movement of a million people to join, all right? If you don't want to put your hand in your pocket and pay five pounds a month, Still take this knowledge on board and go and join a free, free, free sobriety group like Annie Grace, uh, This Naked Mind, Hello Sunday Morning. Uh, there's a load of them out there. Uh, one Year No Beer. I'm sure they all have Facebook groups or whatever. Don't do this alone. I would love to have you at Strive, but if you don't want to pay the five pound, I totally understand. Go and find a free forum or create one of your own. All right? Create one of your own. I think I was talking yesterday's podcast. Michelle, a striver. She's created her own tribe called Yona. I can't say it. E U N O I A. Yona. Yoni. I don't know. Yoni. Yoni's a vagina, isn't it? I'm getting this all fucked up. Sorry, Michelle. Just called your tribe a vagina tribe. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but Michelle has gone and created her own live sober group of six people. Fantastic. Now, those six people can help her build her walls. Not just the walls around alcohol, but her walls around life that she needs to keep her shit together, right? That's what it's all about. It's about living a wonderful life. Okay, that's it for me. Tomorrow, we're going to be back reviewing the fabulous book by William Porter, Alcohol Explainer. We'll be talking to the great man himself the day after. In two days' time, November 1st, the taster starts. It's 49 quid. Um... Do yourself a favor and buy it or buy it for someone else that you love that you think they could do with having a month off alcohol, okay? And we'll get them on board and we'll knock them up and uh, knock them up. That's getting them pregnant. We won't do that. We will build a wall up so they won't be able to knock it down. i got to get off this podcast. I'm waffling here. Right. Catch you later. Love you all. Bye-bye.